Welcome to Startup Grind Barcelona. This is event number I don't remember because we've been doing this for seven years already. Prior to the pandemic, we hosted this very event one year ago, and I shouldn't be boasting about it because the pandemic was already there, just in Barcelona, maybe not that much. But we hosted uh, every year in February, we host the VC panel, the VC night, right? And we host some of the most interesting, prominent investors in the scene, people we like, people we want to learn from. And we'll be hosting this amazing gentleman tonight and somebody else, Ali Burns, who will be joining in a minute. But I'll start introducing Startup Grind for those who are not familiar, for those who have been maybe hiding under a rock for the last 10 or 11 years. Startup Grind is the biggest independent community of entrepreneurs worldwide. As a matter of fact, we are in over 600 cities in more than 135 different countries in very remote places such as Mauritius, Mongolia, Moldova, Gibraltar, Andorra, or San Cugat del Valles, right? So if we're there, literally, we are everywhere. What we do is we foster entrepreneurship with mostly uh, monthly events where we host and interview and learn from entrepreneurs, investors, game changers, disruptors, inventors, celebrities, and people we can uh, generally be inspired by and we can learn from. We've been doing this in Barcelona for seven years, as I mentioned. Uh, we did 74 monthly editions of our event until February 2020. We had hosted three editions of the Startup Grind Tech Conference in Barcelona, which is our regionally and independently organized conference for, uh, based more on tech startups that we hosted every year in Barcelona since 2017. But unfortunately, this uh, year's edition has been canceled because of the of the pandemic. Looking forward to bringing it back. Startup Grind is different from other communities because not only we have got this entire world coverage, but also we've got a set of values that's very, very important. As a matter of fact, this is the reason why some of these people are here in this event, right? And I want to welcome Ali to the to the to the chat because right now I'm talking about the values, right? And the values that we've got at Startup Grind is give first, make friends, not contacts, and always help others before helping yourselves. And that's the reason why we have this selection of very extraordinary people here. Looking forward to chatting with them, to learning from them, because at Startup Grind, what we value a lot is our friendships over the years. So we have had some of the some of the people we met in 2014 when we started uh, have being again on our on our show some people we met back then my friend instance ali how are you doing ali uh we met i think I, i'm gonna start, i'm gonna start with you because you, you were the, the last one to join thank you for being here we met in 20 i think it was late 2014 early 2015 when she was working with steve case and i remember in the very first star brand event in barcelona we said like there is a possibility that we might bring steve case in barcelona there was like such a thing we were pitching this to our audience for many, many months, and then we realized it might not happen after all. But in spite of that, you know, we were in contact with, with Ali. Uh, her team has been fa fantastic, super supportive of Startup Grand and Startup Grand Barcelona in this case. And I'm super glad to welcome you to, to this event. So let's, let's start with you, Ali. How are you doing? Welcome from overseas. I'm doing great. Uh, yeah, greetings from DC. You can probably see the sun coming in, so it's uh, still earlier in the day. Um, but it's great to be here, Ali, and I lead Village Capital. We've got you, we've got Farhan from Tennis Group, we've got Borja from Nauta Capital, who was already on this very panel two years ago, but we met in person so we could drink beer. And we've got Olivier Jim, I don't know if I pronounced that correct, from AWS. Um, welcome, everybody, to the, to the show. Welcome to Startup Grand. How are you doing, everybody? Not going to answer. Good. Happy to be yeah. here. All good. Happy to be here. Thank you. Likewise, thanks for having me. No, it's a, it's a pleasure. Actually, what we want to do here today, because last year was a game changer for everybody. You know, there's this, some people call it a black swan. Some people just call it a crisis. Some people call it transformational moment in the entire world. But I want to hear your opinion on this, because we all had a plan. We always had a plan. And we did have a plan in January 2020 for last year. But all hell, hell broke loose, right? What happened? What changed last year? How many things did we have to revisit and change and adapt to over the course of these? I think, at least in Barcelona, it was late February, early March that we didn't know how long this was going to go for, what was out there, how it was going to affect this, our company, our family, our personalities, our mental health. 
this is probably the only generic question I will ask to all of you. Then I will be going for specific questions to all of you. So who wants to answer this first? What happened last year and how did you have to adapt? Uh, I, can, I can go first uh, if you want. Perfect. I think last year was a, you know, a, a challenge for everyone, really. I mean, it, it's something that we, we never really foreseen or we never really prepared for. Um, but I think, you know, all in all, I, I, I think we'll, we'll see uh, great wins and great um, um, things coming out of this of this pandemic and this crisis. I think, you know, we, we adapt a lot as, as human beings. And I think we, we, we have, uh, you know, we're searching for ways of um, continue to um, invent, innovate, live better um, and, and you can already see you know those changes uh, applying in the way we we work in the way we live where we live um, how we you know the healthcare um, um, innovations that we that we see so I think you know once we're out of all of that I think we'll see different uh, um, wins and great things um, uh, coming up who else wants to go next I think yeah, I'm, I'm happy to, to go next um, you know, I think while it's been, you know, an emotional time, a really stressful time, a really, you know, kind of painful time for, for most, if not all of us, right? Um, from the health perspective and the mental health perspective and the financial health perspective for, for most of the population. Um, at Anthemis, we're looking at this as a bit of an accelerator, right? So in terms of a lot of the, the bets we made, in terms of companies we backed, you know, you try to have this view of what the world's going to look like in three, five, 10 years. And what we've seen as a result of the pandemic is a lot of those trends were accelerated, right? A lot of the things that we thought, you know, kind of maybe banks would change or maybe individuals buying habits or maybe individuals investing habits or maybe businesses and the way they buy software or how much software they buy. All of these things that we thought were going to accelerate at some point have come a lot closer in terms of that acceleration curve, in terms of that adoption curve. And I think for us, that's been, you know, kind of great for a lot of the companies we invest in. Um, and it's given us time to pause and look at some of the sectors and see what's on the horizon by looking at this kind of point in time as an acceleration of some of those key trends. So it's been really insightful as an investor to kind of see what happens in this kind of crazy scenario when people are forced to kind of do things digital first for most things. I'd, I'd second that um, the the sort of observation that things accelerated things that we were we've been focused on for some time, whether it's future of work and learning or health or um, you know supply chains and food and agriculture. We saw a lot of um, demand shock in addition to some of the challenges that some of our companies faced last year. I think maybe the question is actually what didn't change in the past year uh, for sure. And certainly some of the companies that we have invested in had really tough years, um, but many others also found surprising growth and accelerated growth that we're really excited about. So, um, and I'm happy to share a little bit more. We also run an accelerator. That's how we make investment decisions. And certainly that, um, we were required to think about things very differently in terms of how we delivered our programming. And um, I think it opened up a lot of new opportunities for both entrepreneurs um, and the connections that we make uh, for the companies around the world. So that's been really exciting too. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I concur with my panel um, colleagues. Um, the thing is we, we, we were talking to investors who um, we focus on the software business and uh, you know, technology, uh, which has been the winner of last year. But by the way, last year I've heard it described with a lot, you know, stronger words that have been used here. But uh, um, let's keep it polite. Um, <laughs> I am very, very pessimistic in the short term. Really, like the real economy has been decimated, and we are very optimistic because we, fortunately, we chose to. Uh, to focus on the technology world. Um, and I, I agree with Ali and uh, Farhan the rest of it. Last year, uh, the connections between humans were redefined. Uh, the situation was completely uh, turned upside down. And um, there's in the middle and long term, I am very optimistic. We are human beings. 
we lack like cockroaches, we adapt. You know, so no matter what happens, and we get thrown at us. In the short term, there will be a lot of pain, and it's uh, uh, really, you know, we're privileged. I feel privileged uh, last year, uh, considering what I see. But uh, in the middle term, really, uh, technology has been uh, progressing leapfrog. So I, you know, my my parents are using Zoom, and uh, they're using, you know, they're shopping online. Um, th these things are actually going to change probably their uh, later years. You know, that, that's going to stay for the next 30, 40 years. Um, so I see how my grandparents' generation lived. And uh, the last years, obviously, they were harder. I think the generation of my parents and our generation will get benefits in the future because of all, all the transformation that are happening. So... I want to bring it back down to exactly how people are impacted by technology. And that's how I want to light some, shine some optimism, you know, in the short term, a lot of pain, middle long term, probably life will be a lot better for people, thanks to the progress that we're going to be making in the next five years. All right. There's two reasons why you are all on this panel, right? One of them is either your friends or your friends of friends, which ultimately turns you into our friends, right? Um, there's a connection with AWS where partners, global partners, AWS has been supporting startup grind big time every time. Uh, and Antemis, our investors in Cladara is one of our favorite companies from Barcelona, but now that we had already hosted. And Ali, we, we met through startup grind many, many years ago, right? But there's a second There's a second reason because, you know, most panels out there are just like random people thrown together into a chat, right? This is not the case. I selected each one of you because you represent, each one of you represent a different sector that grew last year, right? One of them is impact and sustainability. That would be Ali. There's gaming. Um, Olivier, there's B2B. And I know that sounds very generic, but it's like I'm very interested in the, in the B2B tech part, which is very intensive in Nauta. And there's payments and fintech, uh, which we're going to cover with Anthemis, right? Let's start with, let's start with Borja, actually, because you were raising a really good point here that you are pessimistic in the short term. However, I think that most, that like, people have been very affected by the pandemic, but companies, not that much. And one of the things that has kept the, the economy alive, at least in the bigger scale, is that companies, especially in the tech bubble, have been somehow unaffected by this, right? And we have kept buying, we have kept, you know, because we work in SaaS and you pay up front a monthly, uh, monthly fee or maybe the, the yearly fee. So it's not like we have cut all the costs or all the expenses in the company. So in a similar way, like I think that we have managed to keep afloat part of the business because of the, of the, of the B2B sector. What are your thoughts on this and what things did you not expect that you found last year? Um, well, I mean, the co companies uh, that have sustained last year uh, hit have been mainly the ones that were either basic um, essentials like uh, you know groceries or health and, uh, and and anything which is related to technology. But uh, that, the reason why I'm pessimistic in the short term is because uh, you know most real economy has been hit. And uh, we're talking about people being laid off uh, in manual intensive uh, industries, uh, anything consumer facing, uh, having mm -hmm. curtailed. And that involves lots of people uh, which are not earning now and therefore will not be uh, you know, consuming in the future. It is true that lots of people have not spent in the last year. So we've been saving. A few of us have been lucky to keep their, our jobs, have been saving. So we will consume you know, when, when time comes. Uh, say holidaying in the summer, you know, hopefully buying uh, uh, something or moving to a new house or something in the future. But in general, companies have been, uh, you know, affected. So these companies are the ones who are buying software at the end of the day, okay? And uh, the thing is, um, for the B2B software, uh, the good thing is companies have realized that they need to move to the 21st century finally. Lots of companies that were still you know, dragging, moving to the cloud, dragging the use of uh, artificial intelligence or uh, I don't know, robotic uh, process automation, things like that, they, they are gonna do it. 
And that's good for us because we're going to serve them that. That means that they, uh, that doesn't mean that they are like able to, to, to pay anything we want. Okay. So for example, we see some companies that have been getting high demand. Okay. However, because of the situation stress that they are currently in the budgets, um, for example, the approval for the payment of these or the, their purchasing of, the, of their software has gone up all the way to the CFO. Okay. That means if the CFO gets involved, that means the situation is not easy. Okay. It's not like the, the junior can actually approve a 50,000 euro uh, payment. So, so this thing that we have seen where a company, which is high demand and we really want technology because we need to progress. We need to move forwards to the cloud and, you know, to be able to move online, our uh, commerce, whatever. That's great. And that's going to happen eventually. But in 2020 and 2021, the CFO has to approve expenses. Okay. So that's why in the short term, then the short term is like a bottleneck. It's a bottleneck because obviously the CFO will think about it. It has like 20, 100 emails uh, to look into. So my opinion is there will be hopefully a glut of demand for B2B software coming late this year, 2021 and 2022 and onwards. But until then, the companies uh, that you know they're gonna be like holding their holding their horses. One quick question for you, Borja, then. Because um, I, as an investor, I only invest in B2B, but I recently have incorporated this into my pitch, which is I also invest in B2C companies who don't know they are B2B yet, right? So in your case, you're very focused on B2B companies, but you might have companies that have got a hybrid model, or maybe they've got like a small thing that it's B2B. What have you seen in the market? Or maybe companies that you have discarded now is, hey, call me when you're B2B, Right. Have you seen like a <laughs> like a forced switch to B two B precisely because there's been a, a regular demand? Okay, I'll let you answer. Absolutely. This. So the two actual two is, the funny thing is that there is a um, I think there's B two B and B two C world are converging in the sense that the in the in the business world uh, software is getting consumerized. So because people are working from home, uh, people don't know what devices I'm using or don't, they don't need to care. I mean, I could be using Apple, Mac, I could be using this software, that software, and the business to be ready, okay? Because I'm working from home, I'm not going to the office. So that is moving the business world, business buyer towards buying like consumers, or at least allowing the employees to act as consumers and buy business, uh, business items, okay? Um, that's number one. This is one of the reasons why we invested in Kilara, by the way. <laughs> and, uh, but then on the other side, we see lots of consumer facing companies that have seen their uh, cost of acquisition grown uh, because people were not buying and uh, their retention dropping. And therefore, it didn't make sense to go to this B2C model. So they're starting to switch and either do B2B directly, and that's it, or B2B2C. Okay, and this is what we've seen recently in a couple of businesses, which we saw a few years back saying, oh, you guys are doing just B2C because you will now be Facebook standard back in 2010. You know, everybody wanted to be Facebook and yeah. now people want to be Salesforce, which is great. So for us, so uh, th this is like a change. And then they call me and say, hey, do you remember what we, does? we talked two years ago? Well, we are now doing what you suggested. Okay, thank you. And, uh, and that's when we're looking into, into them again. So yes, we are seeing that kind of change in, in business model. Olivia, connected to this, connected to this, because Borges said, you know, there's a, the B2B part has been spending, people have been laid off, there's been more unemployed people. However, we've seen a huge race and the gaming aspect of things. And not only that, also in passion economy, right? Uh, which are intertwined. Companies like Twitch are the gaming or the passionate economy are both. Where are your views on this? And maybe you can share. I think you've got like some data, at least from, from France, but maybe we can extrapolate that for, for the rest of the world. Yeah, I mean, you know, definitely there's been, um, it's been hard last year for everyone. So I think everyone, you know, staying home, uh, you know, you're trying to find some activities that you can have fun with. And gaming provides you with, you know, the most exciting type of media out there right now. And you know, you talk about uh, Twitch, and there's the social media aspect of it, but there's also the interaction 
uh, with the different games that you have, and then you have mobile games, and then you have the PCs, and then you have the consoles. It's a family thing as well that you can that you can play. So it's been a, a, a big, big, uh, um, you know, I- increase. So today it's you know close to 160 billion dollars of an industry. Uh, it's probably gonna uh, go to 200 uh, billion within the next year and a half. It's a 10% growth, right? And then you have different growth in different regions. But towards the investment side, um, and and to go back to what was said before, I think gaming is seen as a dangerous bet from VCs, and I'm, I would love the, the rest of the panel to to comment on that if, if they want. Um, yeah. You know, it's like investing in a in a movie, right? It it can be a big success or it can can be a failure. So the the trend that we're seeing right now is is more towards uh, the companies that are uh, gravitating around gaming and that are playing with data, uh, you know, and helping gamers to be better gamers or, uh, uh, you know, share uh, their their uh, excitement journey through the gaming. You know, oh, I get I got a, a great win. I'm sharing this on social media. And so two weeks ago, we saw two investments from uh, prominent French VCs. There were, you know, both were 14, 000, uh, 14 million, I'm sorry, and 15 million euros. And that brought the gaming to the second uh, investment vertical uh, in France that week, which is, you know, the first time that that something like this happened. So um, I think, I don't know if we can call it a trend already, but there's definitely something there. Um, and it's also, you know, just to finish on that on that side, there's it's also uh, historically, there's a lot of business central that have been, um, you know, in, investing in in, in gaming um, earlier on. So um, because there are more and more business angels, there's more and more investment in on that vertical as well. Yeah, yeah I, I'd love to add just a little bit on that front from a financial services perspective, you know, having kind of looked at how almost kind of embedded technologies to enable gaming have proven to be big winners, right? So if you look at Unity, if you look at Twitch, all of these that were platforms that games could either be built on or, you know, kind of connecting with users. So not necessarily the studio model of building games. And I think there is still kind of room for new games and new studios to come up. But as a venture investor, you know, we're more excited about the underlying infrastructure wave that's still happening from a gaming perspective, right? Because if you think about like Carlotta Perez and, you know, some of her kind of research and, you know, some of her thinking around that infrastructure wave and then the consumer wave, I think from a gaming perspective, while the consumer wave almost came first, now we're seeing the infrastructure wave around how you can embed finance, you can embed infrastructure, you can make it a lot more, you know, kind of dynamic to kind of build all of these other commercial models alongside gaming. So we're quite interested in, and I would apply some of that to other passion economies, the music industry, we're seeing a lot of financial services startups trying to kind of alleviate some of the pains for artists and for fans as well. And we're seeing the same thing with entertainment and other sectors in the passion economy as well. So really exciting time to see some of these embedded finance angles around some of these passion economies as well. I wanted to double down and like, you know, uh, talk a little bit more about passion economy. And that's something I'm going to be a- asking Ali. But first, one thing that I think we have we have skipped here, and I just discovered the other the other day when I was talking to Olivier, which is VCs are reluctant to invest in gaming precisely because they, they don't have, they don't get to invest in a game. They have to invest in a studio, right? So they invest in a company that might produce multiple hits, which sounds reasonable, but also you're producing in a company you're investing in a company that, you know, maybe it's like Rovio and it's game number 49, the one that went boom, right? So it's not the traditional VC model. So how does that extrapolate to other sectors and what does it make it, like, how can we solve this? How can we incentivate VCs to get into gaming and to invest into studios instead of final products? Um, so I think there there is... Uh, you know, there's a rationality about the game um, um, that you you don't really understand until it's actually out or until it's you know public facing, right? When you have customers on the game, then you're able to really understand you know if there's a passion there, if there's something that will it be able to address a bigger market. Before that, you know, they're they're uh, creative people that are that are you know putting sweat and blood into 
creating a universe or something that they feel very, very strongly about, but you don't necessarily have all the financial side on it. And that's why business angels sometimes get it. And you also have crowdfunding, right? There's a lot, a lot of games uh, and game studios that have been, you know, over the, the, the past 15 years um, uh, funded with, with crowdfunding because, you know, you, you see a fan and he wants to invest and he wants to see that game coming out. So he's going to, you know, take money out of his pocket and, 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 and put it in the, uh, put it in the game. Ali, your turn, because I wanted to talk about passion economy. I know that might not be exactly what Village Capital is focused on, but since you've got social impact, you've got sustainability, and you've got essentially projects, you invest in projects that help people, right? Obviously, we're tackling projects, you're tackling projects that have got to be, have got to do with, you know, poverty, uh, famine, and everything, but there might be also projects in which you're enabling people to have access to, you know, technology or have access to payments, right? Have people to capitalize on their passion, right? Uh, is there something you want to share something about? Yeah, first of all, I love the term passion economy. Um, so, uh, and I also appreciate learning about spaces that I don't spend a lot of time in, uh, like gaming. So this has been a super fascinating conversation. And I, I, um, I do think it's an important tie to the work that we do at Village Capital, which is really focused on supporting entrepreneurs who are creating solutions that both strengthen the fabric of um, all economies, which are small businesses, the ones that are, you know, in uh, more of the, the desperate times right now during the COVID crisis, as well as helping people who have typically been on the margins to live healthier and more productive lives. So we look at sectors like financial health, um, so in the sort of financial infrastructure space, uh, future of work and learning, as I mentioned before, healthcare and specifically equitable access to healthcare, um, food and agriculture, and then some climate tech um, in the sustainability space. And, um, and really it is all about giving people the freedom to pursue their passions, to have access to technology that maybe hasn't been as equitable um, to access. And we're really excited about, you know, the, to the point I was making earlier on um, acceleration of some trends, like there is a real realization with the COVID crisis that um, there have long been um, inequalities um, in the way we operate both globally and within our own domestic economies. And there's an opportunity to solve that, um, not only through government intervention or um, the philanthropic sector, but the entrepreneurs have a, a huge role to play in this um, sort of concept of, of building back better. And there's money moving, there's more and more money moving to these spaces. Um, so we're, you know, what previously we had been sort of the, one of the few players, there are a lot more players who are actively identifying as impact investors. And that doesn't mean I think there's been this sort of uh, re uh, reticence to call yourself an impact investor because that somehow means you are sacrificing financial return. And that's absolutely yep. not the case. Um, and uh, we're starting to see that really play out. Which brings me to my next point, which is exactly looks like most VCs, they take the easy route and they say like, you know, I invest in companies from San Francisco, from California, from secondary markets, maybe, you know, Barcelona, London, so capital cities, but you seem to be all over the globe. You've got offices in every continent and it might be inspired by, I don't know if that, where that idea comes from, but you used to work at the Case Foundation with uh, Steve Jane Case. One of the projects you did was the uh, Rise of the Rest Tour, in which uh, Steve went around America just yeah. to the couple entrepreneurship from Silicon Valley, right? Because it seems like all the focus is on Silicon Valley and fuck the rest, which is not the case. I will do the impolite uh, interjections <laughs> here, right? But um, but one of the th one of the reasons why people go to the principal market, to the, the primary markets, is because you will find more partners to leverage and to help you accomplish your mission. However, you go to countries in middle Africa, right? Which there will be fewer partners with whom, you know, to partner work together. How do you overcome this situation? And do you find like yourself, like what has been the biggest difficulty in trying to partner up or collect more partners to bring into a project and make it a reality? Yeah, in some of the markets we operate in, um, you know, the, the capital stack is very neat and clean and um, you know, we do work in the US um, while we focus on these impact sectors. We work with a lot of traditional VCs um, in the US, Latin America. We're seeing um, a lot of movement towards the spaces that we're operating in. 
but as you, and, and in India as well, but as you know, um, Sub-Saharan Africa in particular, the capital stack is really messy. Um, and, you know, a traditional VC investment doesn't always make sense um, because the, um, the path to exit is very unclear. Um, so it has become more challenging to find partners who will come in and co-invest or be that sort of, we're very early stage, so um, be that sort of secondary um, partner. We, um, what we have seen is a lot of movement to shore up lo the local ecosystems and build out locally based funds in, in these markets. Now, a lot of the money is coming from um, Europe and the, and the US at first, um, but there's so much talent that's being built up um, in each of these markets um, that understands the market, understands how to find the right entrepreneurs. Um, and so if we can build up these emerging fund managers, I think we'll see a lot more activity happening really quickly um, in those markets. But it's, it's definitely challenging. And it's, and, oh. the, and again, the, you know, the timelines look different, potentially the fund structures look different, more patient capital is required too. So as I understand from your, uh, from your comments here is that in 2021, we're still fighting that preconception of social impact means no economic return whatsoever, right? Okay. It's not gonna change anytime soon, right? I hope it. I hope it changes very soon. Um, I think you're seeing. We're seeing some some exits that will battle that Good. that perception ourselves, but uh, also across the the space. Um, I think you're. I hope we will see that change. But it's changed. This is something I worked on at the Case Foundation with Gene um, around yeah. sort of perceptions of impact investing, and it's taken longer than I had hoped. Um, but anyways, a thank you and a huge shout out to your team at Village Capital because the projects that you're backing are incredible. Farhan, um, let's talk about payments because if there's a common denominator in everything we have spoken about right now is payments, right? I mean, money needs to keep circulating and maybe even when we were in full lockdown, some of the countries, some of the cities were not allowed to go out in the streets, we were still buying online, right? And, you know, we all know that maybe in areas like Africa, people went to mobile, they skipped, they leapfrogged into mobile because precisely they could never afford a home computer, right? So payments have always been there. There's been an infrastructure in Africa that's been, you know, kind of like a good framework to learn from. And one of the one of the companies that we actually uh, connected through is Dupe, that they, they had operations in Egypt, right? Um, my question to you is very specific, is what we have found uh, throughout the pandemic is that there's been a growth in payments not only because people have been uh, more online payments, sorry, because we have spent more time at home, but also because we have, or the market has adopted a whole new bunch of people who had never paid online, but they had no other option, right? So what impact has this had in the companies that you're seeing? And if you, the, it's the same company, but the other way around, the, the question I asked Borja, which is like, have you seen, companies adopting more like B2C because there were some opportunities coming from, from uh, other byproducts of the same company? Yeah, it's, it's an interesting kind of area to look at, right? Like, and if you think about, you know, kind of that point you mentioned about the African market kind of skipping the web infrastructure and going directly to mobile, I would also add the Asian market and China specifically kind of Where? skipping a lot of like cards, right? And plastic and moving from cash into QR codes and mobile payments. They right? skipped mobile, they went to apps. They went to apps, right? And, and yeah. embedded applications on that payment side as well. And I think we're only kind of scratching the surface, right? Like when you think about the huge valuations at Stripe from an infrastructure payments perspective and iZettle and their outcomes as well, you know, at the same time, you know, you're seeing the open banking stack becoming more and more mature. And the fact that, you know, the, the, the Plaid Visa deal was struck down in the US, right, is showing that actually, you know, that's anti-competitive because the open banking or the embedded payment side of whether it's screen scraping like Plaid does or whether it's open banking like TrueLayer and Solaris and other companies, Rails Bank kind of allow for from an infrastructure perspective in Europe, right? We're seeing that kind of like navigation and that kind of almost monumental change. But I think we're still quite early in that, right? Now, as to the point about the pandemic and, and some of that, I think a lot of the infrastructure was already there because the, the B2B side had kind of taken this on. I don't think what they recognized was just how many payments were going to come through that kind of channel and just the volume of transactions 
they were going to see through these channels. But from an infrastructure side, you know, they were pretty well served, right? Stripe does a very good job. WorldPay does a very good yeah. job. The infrastructure is there. And when you think about the PISP side or the payments integration side, you know, that's kind of the next wave from the account information from an open banking perspective here in Europe. And I think that's where we're seeing kind of incremental changes in how easy it is to transact through digital products. And I think we're going to see more and more of that adoption. I mean, the thing that also excites me is when we think about, you know, distributed finance as well, right? We're seeing, you know, a huge influx, influx of um, transactions in the cryptocurrency space as well over the last couple of months, right? And will those kind of, you know, disseminate into a multitude of cryptocurrencies or will kind of Bitcoin, Ether, the non-fungible tokens, the investment into those spaces and the payments that resolve off the back of that? You know, I think that's going to be the interesting thing to watch, right? Are we going to see that distribution of payments, not just from a systems integration perspective, but also from a currency perspective? Right. I mean, everybody's been talking about being able to pay in Bitcoin or being able to pay in other cryptocurrencies for some time now. And we're just about to see, I think, this wave of companies that will allow people, you know, more and more infrastructure to make payments in a multitude of currencies. And I think that's where we'll see some major disruption in the near future. And how about because I want to connect your answer to circling back what Ali was suggesting that it's like, you know, there needs to be change in the mentality of sustainability. I know you at Antemis Group, you also invest in sustainable projects or in sustainability as a sector, which for me, it's, I don't know, maybe it's my humble opinion and solicited opinion. It's like, it shouldn't be called a sector because electric vehicles are sustainability, right? But they're no, they're, they're cars, they're mobility, right? It's like, yeah, then what do we consider, um, uh, you know, this sector? It seems like you only get the, the leftovers and that's not true, right? If we're investing in producing cleaner cars, cleaner energy, why is that called clean tech and not sustainability, right? I don't know who adds the passion. What's your, what's your vision? That's a question for both of you, actually. Yeah, I mean, whoever wants I, to go first, I'll go first because um, yeah. I've already unmuted. Um, but uh, yeah. I think the, the interesting thing for us is like sustainability impact is a broad umbrella, right? When we think about embedded finance, because we are kind of financial services experts and fintech experts. So we think about embedded finance meeting sustainability in a lot of these kind of sectors, right? So from a payments perspective, you know, we're seeing kind of how do you make, you know, the payments infrastructure more, you um, towards kind of net zero or carbon zero, right? Like what is the cost around the transaction side, the production of plastic and all of this kind of stuff as well, right? At the same time, from an insure tech perspective, you know, we made an investment in a company called Flow uh, a few years back, which exited last year that looked at water damage and water leakage, right? And now that provides a home with the idea of around water damage from an insurance perspective, but it also means that there's going to be an impact in terms of how much water leakage and how much water wastage is actually seen as well. So I think, and then we look at financial wellness, right? Like we've been talking earlier on about the impact of the pandemic on those with, you know, kind of the most need uh, from financial services who maybe don't have the most access. And we made an investment in a company called Wallet, uh, which I personally led, which is looking at, you know, almost like income insurance for people with volatile incomes. Right, because if you think about the gig economy, if you think about key workers, yeah. these are nurses on shifts, these are supply teachers, these are healthcare professionals, you know, and a lot of them, you know, have really high fluctuations in their earnings. How do you provide tools for them as well? You know, we've really kind of doubled down on our impact around financial wellness, and we're spending a lot of time and energy looking at companies that will make people's lives better and then hopefully make the world better. And I think to your point earlier, I totally agree, you know, impact, sustainability, these are broad categories, but there's fundamental ways in which you can look at financial services, you can look at energy, you can look at all of these other specific sections and see how those can make an impact uh, as well. Ali? Yeah, I would agree wholeheartedly with that. And um, certainly um, some overlap in some of the things we're thinking about in the financial health space um, and financial wellness. Um, that sustainability should move from a term that is considered a sector um, to a category that we look at in everything that we do as a society, frankly. Um, and if we're not doing that, um, then are we really thinking about our future as a planet? Um, and, um, and that goes for, so we've sort of evolved our own language around this or to talk about sustainability of people and the planet. Um, and 
that really should be not only um, sort of a, a broad catch all for subsectors that are um, really focused on whether it is climate tech or clean tech or um, things that are related to sustainability of the planet. But as again, we added people because we really think it's important to make sure that we're not leaving people behind, um, that everybody has the chance to use the, the exciting digital infrastructure that's being built in the financial system um, to actually make their life better, not just have a bank account for the sake of having a bank account, but can they actually use that bank account um, or the access to digital payments um, to increase their savings, um, to uh, smooth out their income if they're a gig worker, et cetera. So um, I really think that that's my long-winded way of saying, like, I really think sustainability is a thing that we should be applying across everything that we do and not necessarily considered a, a sector um, in and of itself. Yeah, and actually I get like really infuriated when I get, when I see pr press releases from companies raising huge amounts of capital or like making marketing stunts for, I don't know if you remember an app called Yo. Basically it was oh, an app that yeah. just allowed you to say, send Yo to your friends. It's like, it got all the press, it was all the rage, it hired people, it raised money. It was stupid as fuck, right? And I, I don't know why these, these things, they get more press than actually sustainability, sustainability projects, right? Which actually they care about our planet. No planet, no Yo. No Yo. That's, you know, regardless of that, we're going to have a plan or not, right? So my point being, what what do we have to do? Or maybe is this, is this the year, Ali, in which society has taken a step back and reflected a little bit more upon the fact that, wow, we really need to take care not only of ourselves, but also our planet? I do. Um, I, I was, one of the things I was kind of noting down as we were think, talking about the impacts of COVID is, is that there has been this reckoning a lot of different levels and that's maybe what's made the year both um, such an opportunity but so painful that like we have no more time to waste um, when it comes to thinking about the health of the planet. Um, what I would say is um, that doesn't mean that every entrepreneur needs to be solving a problem that's directly related to the things that we are focused on um, but it does mean that it's important for companies to start early and thinking about what is their impact on people and the planet um, and being more intentional about that. So um, I, I'm very optimistic um, and uh, that is also, you know, there is also the, the other, the devil on my shoulder, I guess, that that's like, we, because we have to be, um, we've, gotta, we've gotta move quickly and we've gotta move now. Yeah, Borja, well, I think you wanted to add up something to this. Yeah, so you were asking whether this is a time, you know, the year when society reflected. We, we don't know yet, but it is true that we, we are VCs here, right? I think at least uh, we are financial VC. Uh, our LPs, so our investors, have thought about it and they're thinking about it and they're asking us about it, okay? So uh, they're not asking us to invest in sustainability sector because again, I agree with you guys, it's not a sector, it's an attribute. Of, of a company. The same way I can say a company could be capital efficient. I can say a company is sustainable or helps sustainability. Um, so our investors are asking us to analyze or to include within our, our analysis uh, ESG factors, okay? This is, this is a fact uh, that has been put on our table last year. So, uh, yeah, previously it was talked about, now it's more like this is on the table, guys, look into it. And we serve our clients. Our clients are twofold. On the one hand is the entrepreneurs, but on the other hand, obviously the investors that give us the money. So we need to pay attention. And if we pay attention as investors, we will look for those you know, business models that at least are less unsustainable. I'm not sure though whether they are fully sustainable or focusing on like uh, increasing sustainability, but at least hopefully, we will do investments that are less, uh, you know, unsustainable. And that is a step forward, I believe. Um, but I think in, in the future, we'll see this as a, an important matter. Uh, I think uh, society is demanding this. Uh, I think the investors are demanding this. And actually, in the middle and long term, it could be the, the, it makes financial sense. So basically, you do well by doing good. Uh, so everything basically is, you know, the, the, the cycle, the cycle ends up being virtuous and, uh, and, and, and everything gets, uh, you know, for the benefit of the, of the society. 
and the other. So the question here is, is this something that needs to be pushed? Uh, sort so of like, like command, control command style or incentivized? And those, that's, that's basically how, how quickly it needs to be pushed. That, that could be the question. Whether it is here, it is here and it's here to stay. The question is whether it's going to be pushed very, very hard and how and when. Just to add a quick note, because, uh, you know, obviously um, I agree with everything that's been said. I, I, I think there's, you know, the, a tech for good movement that's there and that's really pushing entrepreneurs um, from any horizon to push, you know, sustainability, of course, and tech for good and also diversity and inclusion. I think, you know, 2020 was definitely a year uh, where we all realized that we're not doing enough, that we're not doing um uh, what ha should have been done in the past. And I think, you know, if you take those subjects and you put them all in, in, in that expression or term tech for good, I think, you know, it's definitely what we'll see in the future. And I think it's, it should be, and it will be embedded in every entrepreneur's minds um, to push this in France. I don't know how it is elsewhere. Uh, you have the, you know, five, five billion that will be invested in two years into French startups. And one of the um, one of the things that the government will look for is this tech for good movement. So you'll have to show that you're doing something in uh, in the, along those lines to make sure that you are able to raise money. And I think it's definitely the, the way to go. And and um, and it's definitely our future. And it's it's great that we'll uh, you know that we see this together to, today. And that's a really good point. Brings me. My next question is going to go about diversity and inclusion. And I'm going to go into the questions from the audience, actually. Some people have sent this uh, through the YouTube channel. Some people have sent it beforehand um, by email or by a Twitter as well. So um, there's a question of just whoever wants to take this one as actually, or, or may, maybe the companies here that are less global. But have you found that because of, you know, everybody being remote and <laughs> working from back home, um, have you gone out of your comfort zone and invested in companies that were not in the cities or areas you usually invested in? Who wants to take this one? I'm, I'm happy to, to touch on it, but, you know, I think we, we were always comfortable investing in companies, you know, from, from everywhere, you know, from Portland or Seattle through to the Middle East. And we've done an investment in Singapore, which was our first Asian uh, investment as a firm. Um, and so we, we've always been quite comfortable, like going quite broad. You know, we've been distributed. Our, our founding partners live in Switzerland and New York. And, you know, the team is split. I think it's probably about six or seven different locations as well. So we're very comfortable kind of like going quite broad where the companies are. We also made a couple of investments in LATAM uh, in Mexico as well, which were our first uh, there. But I think that we were kind of seeing that coming in the horizon anyway. And I wouldn't say, you know, kind of the pandemic has pushed us to do that. But I do think we've evolved and have gotten more comfortable in making investments in other markets where we probably weren't that comfortable a few years ago. And I don't know if somebody else wants to add up on that, but there's a second part to the question, which is, have you seen that this whole remoteness thing or this distribution of people has increased diversity? actually, in the teams that you are looking the decks of, uh, the best in the pitch decks of? Um, I, I, we personally, we, we at Nauta have not seen a special uh, increase in diversity. I mean, I wouldn't say that it's because of the working from home situation. If there is anything that is coming through, the trend is starting is for their, you know, female founders to be more ballsy, but that's the only thing that may, they may need. Just say, I, I deserve it, uh, hear me out. And uh, but that's probably the only thing that they, their attitude on attitudes is changing. Um, and that may be why they're you know, pushing forwards for like, I'm gonna raise money. And this is a proper business here I'm having in my hands. So, but not because they're working from home, if uh, that's what you are asking. Yeah. Yeah, I would just add to that. Like, I think our activity, so we have a female founders lab. We do a lot of black office hours. 
Um, so we have a, an intention around trying to kind of like build the pipeline and find the, the right opportunities, right? Because we do believe the opportunities are out there, but it's in our best interest as investors to go out and harness those opportunities to find those companies. Uh, we did a company called First Boulevard, which is looking at the black community from a banking perspective uh, in the US through that female innovators lab uh, vehicle that we have for investing. And I think we'll do more of that but I don't necessarily think it's because of distributed teams. I think it's more about investors and us in particular and others like us saying, actually, we need to, to be more active, to engage in those founders, to, to make sure that we're, we're accessing those deals as well that are out there. Ali, actually, one of the things I wanted to touch on is that your fund has invested in half of the companies that you have invested in actually created by women, right? Um, yep. I don't know if you want to add up something to that, but I wanted to briefly comment on a viral. You know what I'm talking about. And I think the audience might not know about what I'm talking about, but they should, right? So you want to touch these two points. <laughs> sure. yeah. um, on the diversity and inclusion piece, I'll just say that these are things, our three sort of problems that we're trying to solve is too little capital goes to, too much capital goes to too few people. Um, so when we're talking about sort of racial and gender and ethnic, ethnic diversity, too few places, the geographic diversity, and too few problems. And this is the, the sort of like impact oriented problem. So, um, so we've, we've seen a lot of volume increase in people asking us to um, share pipeline, um, which is great. So we're really excited about that. Um, on viral, um, so the, as, as I mentioned earlier, we are both, we both run um, at the simplest level, an accelerator um, that uh, we use to make investment decisions. And um, that program is focused on investment readiness. And one of the things that we found um, very early on in our life cycle is that entrepreneurs don't actually speak the language of investor. And investors are often sitting across the table from entrepreneurs who aren't able to articulate um, where they are in their startup journey in a way that really resonates with investors. So we created something called Venture Investment, Investment Readiness and Awareness Levels. Um, it's modeled on a, a, a framework that NASA uses to evaluate what projects they'll invest in. And um, it essentially is an, you know, it's, at its very core, it's a nine by eight matrix that takes eight categories that an investor typically looks at, nine levels of investment. So everything from I'm just getting this company off the ground in whatever way I can to a major uh, acquisition or IPO. And of course, an exit can happen at any of those levels. And really what it does is create a simplified milestone-based framework for entrepreneurs to both self-assess uh, their business um, and talk to investors in a language that is uh, more palatable to describing where they are as a business and helps them get better feedback, um, frankly. So um, anyone, I will do a little plug that anyone can use this tool. Um, we go at a much, a, a much deeper level in our programs, um, but anyone can use this tool by going on to our Abaca tool, which is abaca.app, um, A-B-A-C-A.app, -A um, and do their own viral self-assessment. And I will stop there because I know we have limited time left. <laughs> yeah, we got seven minutes left. Um, two quick questions. And I think th this, one, this one is a fun one. So I think it could apply to any of you. And I'd like to know the answer because this is a good one, actually. And I might, I might answer that myself too. Is Have you seen creative, new creative ways for entrepreneurs to reach out to you seeking investment? Who's got, who's got a great answer to this one? Not really. You haven't been contacted via Twitter or any social network. Uh, I gotta, I gotta pitch that via Instagram. Like, <laughs> somebody saw me in an event. It's like I couldn't get. I saw that you know the, the event posted on the on Star Brand and sorry on Instagram. I was like, okay, here's my deck. <laughs> like, okay, perfect. I, I thought that was have, pretty. I think pretty we have great. slightly different definitions of interesting. I was kind of thinking. Has anybody done like writing in the sky bit.ly forward slash invest in me? And I, I, haven't seen, <laughs> I haven't seen any of those, but like social media kind of outreach, you know, kind of, I think that yeah. we, we get, a, we see a lot of that in our connections, you know, through that. I mean, some of the investments that we've made, I also think it's about building that network over a long period of time, right? So sometimes you meet somebody in one context on social media and then over time you build that relationship and then they come through as an investment opportunity. So, but I haven't seen any kind of that come to mind as, as really out. 
All right. So the last one, that's our signature question to start playing Barcelona. Everybody gets to answer that. Borja has already answered that two years ago, but I don't remember the answer. Or maybe maybe we didn't do it because I don't know. Normally we don't do it in panels, but I'm getting the positive vibe. That this is going to go down very well here. So everybody has got a useless superpower, at least one. I've got 17 or 18 at least, right? Something you do exceptionally well, but it's worth nothing. Like you don't know what you do it for. It's fucking useless. But that's why we call it a superpower because you do it every day and you do it very, very well. What's yours? I can keep 50 tabs open on Chrome. That's my <laughs> useless superpower. Very Only 50? Good at keeping a you lot can of do tabs better, open. Ali. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> you, you can still see the icon with 50. You know that after 63, you don't get to see the icon? <laughs> yeah, I'm going to try to even improve that super useless superpower. No, but that's a very good one. That's a very good example of a useless superpower. I'll go next to inspire the next people. I always shadow star fan events at the same time as my favorite soccer team's matches. Like right now, Barca is playing. I'm like, why did I do it? <laughs> it always happens. Like in every second event, it coincides the time and the day. So what's uh, yours? I, I can do a Rubik's Cube in under two minutes. So it's not, it's not fast enough where I would compete in it, but it's okay right on that front. So that's, that's my useless superpower. So it's kind of like you're not surprising anybody. Like nobody is surprised. But I was like, it's okay, dude. Like <laughs> nice pat on the back. <laughs> wow. That's a good one. That's a good one. <laughs> All right, who was next? Um, I'm 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 not too bad at throwing cards, actually. Right. When I was younger, I used to play um, you know, throwing cards into a hat, onto something, and it's not something that I keep practicing from time to time. So that's completely useless, right? But I still like it. <laughs> That's not something you had in your CV and that what what got you the job at Amazon? No? <laughs> no, I haven't told them about that, but you know, maybe I should have, I don't know. Right. Um, I should have like, you know, put a, a picture on my LinkedIn uh, as me throwing cards in a hat. That's a good one. Borja, you've got time enough to think about one. Uh, to be honest, I, I was looking for one, but really, I, I mean, I, I'm pretty useless as a super power man. <laughs> <laughs> so, I don't know, just thinking about Something I do every day is totally useless. Probably like bringing the notifications inbox of my LinkedIn down to zero. For some reason, like I just click them. Like I don't want them. I just want zero. I don't, I don't care what they are. <laughs> but if you do it every day, that's really good. That's a very wow. good example. <laughs> <laughs> totally Cause useless. It's, cause it's it just drives me mad to have these like red things, like you know, calling for you, and it's like yeah, for some reason, just. Uh, they're very distracting. So because you get the dopamine yeah. shot of like, oh, there's a notification, there's something exciting there. It's like, oh no, it's another recruiter, or it's another, you know, yeah. Ukrainian dev shop or something right. like that. One of the things <laughs> I managed to do on the, my phone is to delete all the notifications. I mean, I, I don't have notifications, not even for WhatsApp, which drives some of my colleagues crazy. But uh, it's great to focus. But the no, the LinkedIn one, I have not managed yet. <laughs> so I'll have to do it. Somehow. But but maybe, I mean, we've heard really good stories at Star Brand Barcelona, actually, of companies who have sold their, so entrepreneurs have sold their companies because they received a message from LinkedIn, right? So from the potential acquirer, and we had one of the biggest exits in the ecosystem that was Trovi. It was biggest exits back then. I think it was 2015, if I remember correctly, 80 million to a Japanese group that contacted him via LinkedIn, which is something unthinkable. Normally, you only get spam on LinkedIn. I don't know what's your take on this. But well, I'll keep them on then. I'll keep them on. I'll keep them on. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right, um, ladies and gentlemen, I think we could wrap. It's a good point to wrap it up here. I think we've covered a lot of stuff. Um, I definitely want to learn more about pretty much everything you do because we had a lot of topics to touch on, but it's good that we had a lot of focus and sustainability, passion economy and payments because definitely I think this is going to shape the world to come or the world that we're transitioning into right now. And it's good that the, the whole population is stepped back or stepped aside and reflected a little, bit, a little bit of where we're headed into and rethink a lot of things that are going on in the planet. So, well, and... You know, and on behalf of Star Prime, just thank you for being here. Thank you for making the world a better place. And thank you for helping entrepreneurs because that's the most important thing. Any parting words for everybody? Anything we need to know? Anything the world needs to know about you or your funds? Last turn for everybody. 
Quick one. Just uh, my, my hashtags these days on LinkedIn are future is coming. And, future is coming. And be happy working. So those are the two things that I would drop now. Optimism. Up to, that's a good one. All right. Oliver, we want to go next. Something you want to share with the world? Oh, no, I was really, really happy to, to be part of this panel. So thank you very much for having me. If you have any um, interest in, in game, you want to just talk about it, you want to exchange ideas, you know, shoot me up on LinkedIn. I'd be more than happy to talk about that. It's a, it's a passion. So um, uh, happy to interact with anyone who has the same passion. Thank you. I'm really happy for you because you get to enjoy your passion, which is gaming with a lot of money, right? <laughs> Coming from Amazon. <laughs> so that's the that's the dream job. <laughs> Ali, you want to go next? It comes with oh, sorry. big responsibilities as well. Great powers come with great responsibility. I think that's it. Uh, Peter Parker's aunt, uh, aunt right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. And so so a side note, it's a French revolutionist who actually said that first and it was taken uh, after that from It's always Marvel. the French. It's always the French <laughs> doing it first. <laughs> Ali, parting words. Um, just thank you, um, Alex, for putting this together. And to everybody, um, I've learned a ton. Um, and I would also echo if anyone wants to reach out. I do not clear my LinkedIn notifications every day, um, <laughs> but I try to do so regularly. So feel free to look me up and reach out. Perfect. Farhan? Yeah, I'd, I'd second that. You know, Feel free to, to reach out to me, whether it's on LinkedIn, whether it's on Twitter. Uh, you know, I'm still waiting for somebody to, to give me a URL in the sky. Uh, but I won't hold my breath uh, on that one. Uh, but yeah, and embedded finance, it's, it's the future. So thanks for having us, Alex. No, you're welcome. We did an open call for our entrepreneurs whenever we have VCs and investors to ask for pitch decks because um, that's the that's when we get your attention, right? We're getting your attention now. And if we send you decks tonight, tomorrow, next week, um, I know that if they come from a warm introduction and warm referral from us, you will be you will taking a, a close look to them. So if you haven't sent your deck yet, send it to me or send it to them directly if you can find their contacts. But um, and done so, a lot of people have done already. So you will be next on the list. All right. Thank you, everybody. Um, thank you for being part of Startup Brand. See you next month with Eloy Gomez from Jeff. Uh, we'll be having a, another Startup Brand Barcelona event going back to Fireside Chat. Until next time, have a nice week, everybody.